All right, so we're all we're, we're all recording. There's, there's no problems. Yes, none whatsoever. Wait, give me one, wait, wait, give me one more second to make sure my audio is good. Okay, yeah, we're good. We're good. All right, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, this, this, this is how it begins all the time. <laughs> all right, so hello everybody and welcome you back. You didn't do it. What? <sighs> no, I'm sk- no, I'm skipping it. No, I'm skipping it. I'm skipping it. No. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Yes. It's not the end of the month, actually. Wait a minute. We're we're recording <laughs> at a healthy amount of time. Yeah. We still have over ten days left in the month. It's still gonna. Oh be my re- god. It's still gonna be released late. You're, yeah, because we're going to get done, and then you're going to sit on it till like, the 29th. <laughs> we are recording as of October 19th, I so know, still I know. not as good as we could be, but better than usual. Egg, exactly. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 18 of the TFI podcast. Today, we are joined by the usual MFK. Hi. And we have... Cyborg Raptor, who we will be referring to as Matt during this podcast. Say hello, Matt. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Not to be confused with the Matt who just missed his exit. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Matt, this Whoops. this is your first time here. Yes. Oh, my gosh. It's great to be here, guys. I listen to you guys all the time when I'm working out. I'm not going to lie to you. Good. I, I, that's good to know. Pump those irons. So, I sure do. Uh, for for those who don't know, Matt here has actually worked in collaboration with us when we were working on Jurassic Spark and was also the voice of Raptor Grimlock in that project. But a more prominent role of his has been a constant return of Astro Train in almost every continuity that has him in. That's right. I think, has there actually been an Astro Train prior to me? No, no, you are the first and only Astro Train voice actor I've ever What's, worked with. Sounds about right. What's so funny is I think I remember getting you to do... We got him as the Halo Cinema character, right? Yeah, we did. And then you were you were casting, like, I think, leftovers for... Like, you were just, like, needing people to fill out the cast for Rollout 2. I was like, hey... I think we did. We, 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 did we talk about getting si- or Matt on the project first, or did we just say, "Hey, I have an idea to make him uh, Astro Train"? I, I think it was just that. And then I, I think I was the one to reach out to you about Astro Train. Yeah. yeah, I remember. I remember we. Uh, I was on Instagram, I think, and I just get a message from UMK, and uh, you and I didn't really talk much. We uh, did some like small like YouTube things with other uh, Transformers creators. But, like, you know, we never really, like, worked together. Uh, I may have to probably voice something for you once or twice, maybe in the past. But, uh, yeah, the, yeah you, you sent me a message saying, uh, actually, uh, I guess when it comes to first, like, meeting with Sam, it was uh, Halo Inquiry? Iniquity. 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 Which was another project I reached out for you for. That's right, yeah. And I was like, sure, I guess. Like, I, I, I honestly don't know why you even chose me. But I was like, all right, I'll, I'll gladly do this. And then uh, that went through, and that was fun. And that was, I guess it was good enough to where you guys asked me back for rollout. Yeah. Two, I guess. Yes. I have. I went, I found our DMs. So the first one I sent was, hey, I was wondering if you were interested in voicing in a non-Transformers-related project that TFI Creations and I are working on. Uh, the character you're playing is Mike, right? And then a couple months later... I say, I got more voice work if you want. The Halo, wait, the Halo project that TFI made is being delayed. Because, oh, that's right. Because technically you were cast as Mike first, but it came out later. We got Rollout 2. F- you did your lines for Mike first, but Rollout 2 came out first. Wow, you said really? It was being delayed because of other actors. But if you're, you're interested, TFI has an open role for Rollout 2. The character is Astro Train. And you said, yes, I'll take the case. <laughs> uh, I told Sam you're in. He'll email you directly. And then that was, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what started yeah, from that, there. That's what started. Yeah. From there, yeah, I that's... decided roll out two. I did then the Christmas special, uh, and then I did roll out three, uh, and then I was, uh, Astro Chain in Gigawatt three. Three. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, as of recently, I am a small, tiny role at the beginning of Steel Jaws. <laughs> Astro Train again. <laughs> Astro Train again, yeah. That, and if I'm correct, Sam, that was not the plan, right? 
Yeah, no, that was not the plan. Originally, it was just, it was just going to be like either the Nemesis ship or even Tidal Wave if I could get them, but I couldn't. And then someone suggested, "Hey, for the crashing ship, just use Astro Train." And I went, "Yes, and I can get Matt and continue the <laughs> bit." <laughs> so here's the weirdest thing for me, Matt. You're such a good actor that I feel like I've used in so Shut many up. projects for various roles Shut that up. I always forget. Like, I swear you've done someone else in TFI besides just. Oh, um, I, Grimlock and Astro Train. I I, a... That's a great question. Have I? I don't. I think because uh, Grimlock is kind of like for me my standout role uh, for yeah. TFI. Um, I... uh, uh, Matt, you were Ratchet in Roll Out. What might have been? Oh my gosh, that's right. Oh my god, that that was super quick in and out. Uh, yeah, that's right. I was Ratchet. You were also Hearts of Steel Optimus. Oh my god, that's right. Dude, that's true. Oh my god, you're right. I completely forgot about that. That was like one of your biggest roles too. <laughs> so another project, because I know I can actually, I can talk about this a bit. So as of time of this being uploaded, the comic dub will be published. I was going to say, like, I, I was assuming that this is going to be a prom cross promotion for the comic. Yes, because it's really funny because like three, three podcasts ago, I said, oh, on the next podcast, it will be up. And yeah. then it wasn't, but it will be up as of this recording. It should be public. You got to voice Jetfire in Sam and I's, like, Skybound comic fan dub. Please, go see it. Go see it. It's really awesome. I loved it. I loved being a part of it. Everyone does such an amazing job. Everyone here, everyone that we know. There's people I've never, like, even talked to. All their great work. Uh, I, I, I'm so... Sorry, I forgot her name, but the person who does Carly does an amazing uh, job in this. She, 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 Shiana, or I think it's Shiana. I think that's it. I've never yeah, actually, I've I, only seen it written. I've never actually heard. Uh, she stand, stood out to me a lot in the in uh, this project. Everyone, again, everyone did a great job, but I loved her take. I'll talk a little bit about her. She's actually just a voice actress that I stumbled across, uh, and by I. He'll beat me if I don't give him proper credit. Spooky D-Man, he found her on Fiverr, of all things. And so then I reached out, and I was like, hey, are you interested in this? And she was like, sure. And not only did she do the lines for this, but then she's like, I want to do the next one. And I sent her um, the link to the unlisted one. And she she said she really liked it. She's super excited to do uh, issue two. And I'm like, yes, good. Good, good. Uh, no, she was great. Uh, one of the things I really... And it's really interesting. You weren't there. So I, I want to talk a bit about how this dub got started. Exactly, Literally exactly a year ago, I think, at this point. Um, Spooky D-Man and I were in a chat with um, Steven and uh, Shock Blaster. Uh, those are people who've been in TFI films and have, you know... You well, uh, Steven voiced uh, Ultra Magnus in um, Jurassic Spark. He voiced uh, Highbrow in... The rollout series, Sideswipe in Mexico City, and so on. And then Shock Blaster most recently was Cannonball in Steel Jaws. Um, and a surprise character at the end of Gigawatt 4. So we were in a call, the, the four of us, and Spooky D-Man was reading the comic. And I think he was streaming it. And he got to, like, I think he got to the first part of, like, the Transformers showing up. And I kind of got, we all got interested. I was like, oh, hey, let's restart. And let's just read through it as a group, like dub over. So then it became us doing voices. Um, and it was it was fun because like we're reading through this comic. And obviously some of the voices from that night actually stayed. Like I stayed being Starscream. Uh, Spooky D-Man stayed Optimus and Soundwave. And then Shock Blaster, he surprised me the most because he's like, hey, I have an idea for Ratchet. And he does that voice, that like gr like grumbly old man voice he did for Ratchet, and I'm like, I heard that, and I'm like, I wanted, I want to see this full thing with the production now, not just us goofing around in calls. I want to hear like, and I think when we finish the comic, we're getting to the end, and there's that you know Jetfire's whole, uh, I have failed, everything will die. I remember I saw that, and I'm like, I need an actor that can perform this, and it was literally like a second after we finished reading, I was like. I know who I'm getting for this. I think I want to say, hold on, let me see when I DM'd you this. Because I know you were thought of, like, instantly. If not the same day, it was, like, within the week of me coming up with this comic dub. You as Jetfire was, like, a no-brainer. Yeah, no, it would have been at max a week after, um, after we did this initial, like, 
uh, like read through. But I, I, I had the idea of you having being Jetfire right away. But I didn't have a specific voice or anything. I'm just like I knew with your acting ability you'd be able to pull off Jetfire. And then you sent me the lines. You sent me the first run of the lines. And again, that that whole like Cybertron will die, everything will die moment. I'm like. I did. I I picked the right actor for this. That was incredible. Ah, shucks, dude. You didn't go out to say that, but I I appreciate it. And I actually I did love the role. If I was so excited, um, because so yeah, when you first uh, uh, invited me to come aboard for this project, I originally thought uh, because you uh intended two roles for me, one that kind of petered out for another thing. But uh, the other, so like I thought we were going to do Void Rivals. I thought, because I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, we're doing these Skybound comics. We're going to do all of it. I thought we were going from Void Rivals to Transformers 1 to Duke. Uh, and uh, so I was like, oh, crap. Okay. Uh, and so I sent you his uh, introduction to the two characters in Void Rivals. Uh, and I'll, and even, like when I first recorded, I'm like, oh, that was actually, that was kind of fun. I, I kind of hope this kind of, you know, goes somewhere. Whatever. Like, I don't know, is this even going to go anywhere? So, uh, but when I was told that we're going straight into Transformers, I got super excited because, you know, that just means we're more Jetfire. Another interesting thing is, I've, I haven't gotten to talk about this, but your audio is altered in that. Because you recorded with a mic that you weren't very comfortable, like, you ended up not That's liking right. the sound of it. Yeah. So, originally you sent me the lines, and I we edited a scene together. Sam and I threw a quick scene together, and we sent it to you. And you were like, yeesh, I do not like my audio quality. Mm -hmm. But I remember I loved your performance so much and the way you said those lines. And I loved the way Jetfire sounded in those scenes. Like, I loved how damaged he sounded because of the audio quality that I was kind of like, I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I want you to re-record them. But then you came up with an idea that I'm so glad you did because I, it's such a cool thing that I don't know if everyone will notice, but I hope they do because (laughs) it's such a clever concept. At the beginning, you re-recorded Jetfire's first couple lines with a better mic. So at the beginning, he sounds much more clear. And then when he gets shot by Starscream, we transition to your original recording, where it's that more, like, the worst audio quality. So it makes it seem like he got damaged during that and his vocal processor is, you know, not at 100%. And I did a... I blended... Because you did the ga in both versions. You know, you did him getting shot in good quality and bad quality, and I blended them together. And if you listen, you can notice the the shift in voice, but I think it's pretty seamless. If you don't know it's there, I don't think you notice it. Yeah, I agree. I, I If anything, I didn't even notice it when we when I was first seen, like, first shown the uh, the first cut. Uh, I first second, and I was like, oh, did they not use my, um, my, fir- my second version? But then when he got damaged, I'm like, oh, yo, there it is. There's the the rough audio. Uh, so yeah, uh, it was. Uh, I'm glad. I'm I'm glad that kind of just popped in my head. I was just trying to think of a way to make it work because I also enjoyed my take in the bad mic. So I was like, we. I I don't want to. And I, it was also me trying to be lazy, be like, I don't want to re-record everything. <laughs> I when it comes to comic books, my biggest problem is I tend to be a bit of a fast reader in the sense that like I don't have the patience to just admire the art and then move on to the very next like I I quickly will read a panel and move right to the next without feeling a natural pace to it when I when I edited the scene um because for 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 context for those listening MK is the one who actually put all the panels together and added the lines all I did was I had I either slowed or sped up the pacing of each panel and added the sound effects and and the music and such and the effects in the background but when I was able to edit the Jetfire and Optimus scene I slowed that pacing down a lot and I was able to really appreciate that scene even more now and when I added in the music I was like I think this is my favorite part it's just it's just so good and Jetfire is already one of my favorite Transformers characters. And now we got one of my favorite voice actors to voice him. Uh, ah, shucks. <laughs> but you guys make a great point that uh, something that uh, I was going to bring up is that uh, not only obviously is the uh, all the acting talent amazing, but the editing for both you guys. When I was watching it uh, earlier, 
uh, just the, the small things like, yeah, we have uh, that space background while the panels are going up and down. But there's the like when there's actually gone, there's smoke coming up from behind. There's fire coming up from behind. Uh, like and even just those small bits of like when Spike and Carly are in the arc and you hear just like that. The go, 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 like the sound of metal kind of like, you know, swaying through the mm-hmm. wind. That's very it's a very TFI thing. You have a lot of those like just the sound effects going through. Uh, which you kind of you can kind of feel it like oh this is very much a TFI kind of production as well, uh, but like just all that awesome effects and the moving of the panels were all super well done. So here's first of all I have to give the actual now I told Sam I we did brainstorm the idea of certain effects popping up, but one thing I I didn't Sam came up with like the um the smoke popping up or like the blood splatter when Starship yeah. switches and. That was all Sam. He literally sent that to me. He's like, hey, it was the first scene I think you tried that with was the jet fire bring them back to life. I think that was the first scene you tried that with. Mm-hmm. And it. Um, I remember seeing that. I'm like, that's amazing. Like, yes, keep this up. And then with the certain, certain things, the way the panels were, I know I did a little bit of that. Like, my favorite one I did was when they're falling and the oh, them screaming yeah. block, you know, moves the panel but one thing you can't really notice because with episode with the first one i actually edited it very out of order like i didn't go page by page i started with like page 20 like the first page i think i edited was the one where Jetfire is like coughing and he's like and then uh starts gives like you fools are weaker than us in every way like that that i think that was the first page i ever edited and something I think, and I obviously it's just gonna get better as it go it goes on. But I got better at like do I got more when I first started. I was like, oh, let me just have the panels just play one after another. Let me only have one panel on screen at a time. But as I kept going, I got more comfortable with it. And I was like, oh, let me put multiple panels on screen. Let me do some transitions. Let me do some movements here. And what I, because I edited it out of order. It, you don't notice it. It's not like it starts off like kind of slow and then immediately gets up or vice versa. It's consistently, or it's I guess it's consistently inconsistent because one page, one page will have like really cool stuff with the panels and the next will just kind of be bland. But I think that actually helps it be less noticeable because it just, it doesn't make it seem like at one point, you know, it doesn't seem like at one point I put more effort in it than the other. It was more just, I didn't really know what I was doing when I was starting. I was learning from the get-go, figuring out what I was doing. Where by the time I got like ten pages in, twenty pages in, I'm like, okay, I have a system for this. How can I? How can I spice this up? And so, like, one of the last panels I ever did was them falling off the driving off the cliff, which is where you get that like the scream covering the or getting rid of the original panel. It's where you get a lot more of those creative ones. It's it's definitely like I I, I look at the comic dub and like I think if I could sum it up to one word, it's just quality. Like ev- everyone gives it their all. And you know, the, the he, Daniel Warren Johnson's artwork to begin with is gorgeous. And to be, and to see it with sound effects and music and atmosphere, it just helps kind of amplify it even more. And, and Matt to kind of like expand on, on, on one thing that, that you were saying that like when there's the shot of the, the arc and you hear that sort of metal grinding in the background, it's very important to always have a consistent background ambience or or what we call room tone. Like if, if, if you look at TFI films, any scene where they're just talking in like a generic room, there's always a constant sort of drone in the background that never ends. And that actually helps negate um, – because sometimes when, when voice actors send their lines in, you'll hear a bit of ing like before, the, before or after they end the line – Room tone will negate that. And it's so fun doing it for stuff like the arc because you know there's going to be this deep metal grinding sound. And, of course, a lot of sound effects that, like, I borrow from are all from Fall of Cybertron or stuff that I can get from, like, Production Crate and such. And when you slow down metal grinding, you get this sense of this giant hollow ship. And it's just, it's so nice to bring life to these visuals. I, I cannot wait for the next issue because I think 
there's already a lot of quality in this first one. I think going forward, it's just going to improve. Like, I know one of the things is, like, audio quality issue two is already looking way better. So many actors who recorded lines in issue one, because a lot of actors recorded, year, like, a year ago. Or not for quite a year, but almost a year. Probably, like, eight or nine months. Um, so a lot of the lines were recorded a while ago. And so many of the actors, I know, um, Chalk Blaster, uh, Big Green... You, uh, Matt, you all have upgraded your audio since then. So going for the future, it's like, oh, these characters are going to sound even better. Sam and I kind of have an idea with what we're doing, so now we can play with it more. So I think it's going to look better as it goes on. I think the comic dub is just going to get better and better as each issue comes out. I, I definitely want to try to see if we can find a way to streamline production so it's a it's at a consistent pace. I am already in that. Um, I'm once it goes public, I'm gonna start asking for lines. But for context, Sam, I've already like I've been in editing for uh, issue two for a while now. I can once I start getting lines, I can literally start chopping audio together, um, and sending it your way. But because of how much hard work it is, I for sure want to get the first six issues. The first arc is gonna happen. There's the, that's. There's no way we're not doing that. However, I if this I I don't want to promise anything past the first six issues because with how much work it is, I don't want to because again, I'm not in it for views and money, but if I can't make anything off of it, I don't want to commit so much to someone else's work when I could be committing to things I created myself. However, if it does really well, then I would be a lot more interested in working towards doing the rest of the Energon universe. Like I'm basically I I'm using the first six issues as a test. If they do really well, then yeah, we're doing Void Rivals, we're doing G.I. Joe, we're continuing Transformers. Like if I if it does well enough for me to warrant committing my life to this, not my life, but you know what I mean. Like committing so much time to this, then yeah, sure, I'm game for it. But if it's like it doesn't really do much, I at least want to get the first arc. So I say I've have a complete, you know, series of it i have a first volume that's done um i would never i would never just leave it at like one issue or something like that that's and i remember like when i was screen sharing it we were coming up with like the intro like title card and i had my girlfriend naomi who's like really really good at graphic design she replicated mm -hmm. the comic sort of transformers logo that was on there and we threw that in and then we added fan dub and it just it really came together and if you like it so much uh, and you think it's great and you want to see more, continue by reading the comic. Uh, as of right now, it's 12 issues in. And if you love it so much and you want to compare the when we keep doing more issues and you love it so much, uh, keep coming back to us and uh, compare your reading to our work. Gigawatt 4 and Steel Jaws took up like all my time. And now both those products are out. So it's like, all right, I got some time to catch up on like, I, I mean, like, there's the comic dub. I've got voice work for other people to catch up on. There's, like, writing the, the fu future stuff. Going to you guys for clarification on IDW characters. <laughs> like, I finally have time. Speaking of writing on IDW characters, I feel like we could segue into that. We could. That's smart. Because that is something we've talked... We haven't really talked publicly in TFI, have we? It's been mainly a Discord thing and Twitter. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to call this the next phase of TFI because the first 10 years, this this really feels like the new chapter because we're we're taking on a big project um, in, for I guess the next 10 years, you know, a big ambitious project um, because it's a multi-film series thing. But I want to start by announcing, I guess, some negative news for those who were maybe looking forward to it. I know we talked about the idea of Rollout Lost Light. That is something that has been officially cancelled, which I think is one of the first ever really cancelled TFI projects that were publicly revealed. Cancelled for a good reason. And to elaborate on the good reason is I've finally, finally discovered the IDW 2005 comic books. About time, I know. I heard the eye rolls. Okay, it is about time. I've referenced a few, like, panels I've seen over the years, but I finally decided to sit down and just read a few of them. And I've read Megatron Origins, Chaos Theory, slash Road to Chaos, and Autocracy. And they're so good. Like, they are so good. 
when you brought this up to me because you are now working which this is no secret you talked about on twitter uh working on you know chaos theory is a film we're doing an adaptation i remember you brought it up to me and i was like well what about raw lost light because i felt if we're adapting the idw comics we can't not adapt arguably the biggest run in the idw you know in idw's entire like history the biggest transformers run they did is arguably more than meets the eye and i remember getting that and at first being a little disheartened because i felt like i couldn't do roll out lost light because i'm like we're gonna eventually gonna have to do lost light again with idw because if you're doing one, you know it, it was just inevitable and i didn't want to do lost light twice but then when i sat and thought about it I actually kind of got more excited because one of the biggest issues going in with Royal Lost Light, and I can talk about some spoiler ideas, is how much we would have had to change to fit the rollout continuity. Because in rollout, Megatron dies. He's never redeemed. He just dies. Um, there's a lot of characters that actually first aid is dead. Um, what? Cyclonus. Spoiler. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I thought you would. Oh my God! Rollout two, seeming oh. voice of rollout three. I, I I just record this stuff. I don't watch it. What? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, um, so then, you know, and then Cyclonus was an entirely different character in the rollout universe. And I think I was even one of the ideas I had was like just scrapping Cyclonus entirely and then having him. I was gonna actually probably kill him in the beginning. Um, and so there was just so many things that like, or like, we never in introduced the knights of cybertron so i was like how do we juggle like that whole story and it was just this so much of like there would be so much compromise it even got to the point even before sam started doing idw um adaptations we talked about it i was like i don't know if i can call roll at lost light roll at lost light anymore because it is just it's so different they're gonna be on the last light and then rodimus is gonna be there as the captain like that that's that's about as close to Lost Light is oh even Ultra Magnus is dead in the Raw universe like so <laughs> it's many... like a ship of thesis but Lost Light <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's what and so when I thought about it I'm like okay instead of trying to make Lost Light work at the rollout universe if we're doing IDW adaptations let's just do an adaptation of Lost Light so yes while rollout Lost Light is cancelled we're cancelling it because TFI is just making a full on not really standalone because it's going to be connected to the other idw adaptation films but basically a full-on like more than means the eye lost light adaptation yeah we're i you know i i read chaos theory and and i loved i loved all the stuff that um i i was reading and i said to myself damn i would love to adapt these into films and thanks to like the legacy two packs and um, all the figures that are coming out we're getting figures of all these characters and their designs in the comic books and i said these are really popular comics that get referenced quite a lot maybe it's time to actually fully adapt them and at first i was at first i was gonna just do autocracy and i was gonna tie it to roll out and the first draft of the script made it work rather than zeta it was gonna be nova prime and it was just all gonna somehow connect to the first rollout but then it became very, very limiting because I wanted to play with casting and figures. I, I didn't want to just be stuck with the Combiner Wars Megs and the same cast again. Like I wanted – and the more I thought about just making it a straight adaptation in its own new universe was a much more freeing thought. So I altered the script, wrote a new one based on Chaos Theory. That script is pretty much done. And – now I have this reign of just free range of just whatever figure we, we, we want to use, whatever characters. Now I have to run my ideas through MK and Matt here because they know a lot more than I do. I've read three comics. <laughs> They've read a lot more. Um, I sent them the first draft of Chaos Theory and they're like, Sam, you can't use this character. I was like, why? Because they appear later. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was even, you've even been DMing me like, hey, what if we do that? You'd, you'd be like, hey, what if we... uh use this for this i'm like yeah that's cool and all but if we ever get to lost light like we can't do that like congratulations we and so it's i think that's been a lot of fun uh working with this and i think it's interesting because this 
is our second real adaptation series, I think. Origins Unknown. Is is there any other I'm thinking of? Origins Unknown was like, and even then, Origins Unknown is a very loose adaptation of the yeah. comics. Yeah, the uh, a lot of TFI films have a lot of references to IDW. However, in the Dark of the Moon original ending, there's a conversation I'm having between Megatron and a character named Wreckage, and that's very similar to Megatron talking to Ravage. Um, in IDW, and it's. You know, these comics get right. We, we've had Skybound uh, references. We, we had like two in, in Gigawatt. And I've referenced comic books. But yeah, uh, Origins Unknown, it is a it's a loose adaptation that is still pretty close to the comic books. We more or less just take out the things we can't physically do, which will be the same with IDW. However, IDW so far with the Chaos Theory and Autocracy scripts that I've been writing, they are very, very close to what's th- written in the comics i think another thing too with it is when you did origins you were what five years into tfi when you started six years i mean it was what 2019 maybe 20 maybe 2020 it was still or 2020 okay so it would have been six years into tfi it was we were still early you know that was before that's that's pre-maverick pre-steel jaws pre uh Jurassic Spark, pre like pre so many of these films where you were learned so much, where I feel like even now, even Origin season three, like the scope between films now and or films then and now is it's wildly different. The things that you ideas that we couldn't even dream of and think to do in the TFI style a long time ago are things that are entirely possible now. I mean, could you think even three or four years ago you would have been able to pull off something like Steel Jaws? Oh no, S- Steel Jaws was a fever dream. S- Steel Jaws was <laughs> was just was just a hope. Like there was no way. Even Maverick. I remember when Coolera and I we greenlit Maverick, and I'm writing the script, and I'm thinking, how the hell am I gonna do this convincingly? And then when we when Carlos and I were writing Hearts of Steel, I'm thinking, what train characters on tracks? How are we gonna do this? And then Jaws, what, real water? What? And then here we are. All those projects are out. And they work. One thing I one thing I think is really interesting is I feel like there's always, like, proto elements of a... Like, I feel like what happens with a film is you make, you make one film that has slight elements that you're a little like, I don't know if I can get this to work. And then we realize it works, and they're like, okay, well, no. like, I always feel like Return to Earth is, like, the, the test, test the waters for living animals because in return to earth it's like how do we make their dino forms work and we did it way that i felt was well and so then we could approach them like jurassic spark where a lot of the cast is just dinosaurs not robots and so it's it's a lot of that like build up of one project will have a glimpse like going way back i mean you have something like the big climactic scene in origin season two episode three we have that like green screen driving in transform explosion scene that was like kind of your test of like how pulling off i mean you had used green screen before but like having characters move and stuff with green screen and then now you have things like maverick you have things like um why am i forgetting the name of it we just talked about it yeah hearts of steel like ones that use i mean you obviously use pre- plenty practical you you now know what you're doing with green screen you now know what you're doing with digital and it's it's weird to think about when origin season three came out or season two episode three that was just like i hope this works where now it's like okay we know it works so we can use this as like we no longer have to worry about that transformations i mean that's such an easy one that you finally cracked with um legend exists but i mean prior to that it's like how do i get transformations to work you would either do super i mean you still use your original style which is great but then if you need to do a full on-screen transformation it's it's great here's how you do it yeah and hearts of steel has the most digital transformations than any project i was gonna say like every time you think about when i think about the transformations in tfi films my first thought uh goes to hearts of steel because like that was one of your challenges sam if i'm correct is uh every transformation had to be that style of like every transformation had to be on screen you have so many uh, projects lined up. Uh, cause I, I'm not gonna lie. Once you said it, I completely forgot you were doing uh, the alternate Dark of the Moon, uh, like sequel. So that with that and this uh, series of IDW films, 
not to mention uh there's something coming in the future uh i for me i kind of gave me a little bit of joy that uh when steel jaws came out which i never actually t- uh, told you sam we never i, I personally never talked to you about steel jaws and how i super enjoyed it uh great again another amazing story i put a comment and everything but uh i you know as someone who actually did talk to you in person about it uh i thought it was amazing i thought uh they uh crosshairs production did a great job uh for the yeah for that uh scene with the uh, sky bite everyone did a great job uh your water scenes again it's every every time you do a new film there's always something new for you to tackle and you always knock it out of the park with every single one it's 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 insane to me which is and when it comes to new things to tackle uh i do enjoy that the number one uh the most liked comment in steel jaws is teasing something else that is in the works uh that i'm excited for uh that in fact sam is getting sent multiple things from me to one's coming pretty soon actually uh a key component of said thing uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you know, like, I'm, I'm sure you know, know about this, but, uh, so me and Sam have been slowly working on this, uh, Transformers Godzilla, uh, collab film. Yeah. And, uh, the key component is, uh, he's getting the recent, uh, the Haya Toys Golden King Ghidorah. Uh, and so that's shit. Yeah. It, it, I, I just got mine, uh, yesterday. It's right now it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, like wing walking on top of one of my shelves with all of its a uh, it's a uh, gravity beams in his mouth. It's great, and so Sam's comes in Tuesday, and also I have Sam. Uh, I'm giving Sam um uh some uh rock dudes for this uh, film, some other small things that needed that I feel like might be needed, as well as uh, a physical copy of uh, Atrocity with uh, signed signed and artwork inside from Lavivo Remdeli, the guy who drew it all. There's um, there's something neat with the Chaos Theory script that I've done, though, is I've intertwined the first, like, few pages of Megatron Origins. So sort of on the side and in the background of Chaos Theory, Megatron Origins has begun. And um, I'd like your guys' uh, YouTube's input on that with the script I sent there just to make sure it seems well-balanced and, and correctly paced. Now, the funny thing is what, what got me into... IDW recently was actually I was watching a one of the Transformers like the basics videos and uh, it was the history on Orion Pax because of Transformers 1 and there was a part where uh, he was talking about autocracy and how Orion becoming Optimus is almost identical to Transformers 1. And because I love TF1 to death, I'm like, oh my god, like there's 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 a comic version that's really close. Oh, I have to read this. And then I read it, and I loved it. And that's when I fell down the IDW rabbit hole. So Transformers One is is actually to kind of blame for that. And there's a lot of cues from TF1 that I want to pull from as well, because I feel like you know it it did, did a lot of great things. Which is a fun thing to talk about because we actually didn't get to talk about TF1 much in the last episode. Because at the time, while it was out in the States, it wasn't out everywhere and we were still trying to, like, not talk about it as much. So I feel like now would be a fun time to chat about it. Ah. Especially, especially because we have a unique perspective here. Oh my and god! I wanted you're to right. ask some questions. Someone who got to see the movie months and months in advance. That's right. So Matt sometimes goes to for for the audience gets um, you know, goes to early like test screenings of films. So he'll see a film. He'll he'll literally go to a ticket. How is it? Is it sometimes don't they just tell you like a family animated movie for this age range or something? Yeah, that's right. Like so, what happens is that uh, I get an invitation to go see. It will usually say uh, a, uh, for example, an action adventure film, uh, an unrated action adventure film from a major motion studio, uh, and it would sometimes say targeted for families, uh, targeted for adults. Uh, or it would be like with a star-studded cast. It's like, for instance, when uh, I got to go see Transformers 1, this is 
February of this year, so February 2024, uh, I got an email saying, uh, you're invited to go see a action-adventure animated film from a major motion studio with a star-studded cast. And I immediately was like, well, that's Transformers 1. There's no way it can't be. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, and I'm like, all right, well, I, I gotta be, and I even, I wore my Transformers shirt. Like I, I got a little fancy. Um, and I sit down in the theater too. Uh, and, uh, by chance, and there's like, you know, there's a lot of staff around, make sure, you know, security's all tight, tight and stuff. Like if we can't bring in our phones or anything. So I have my little Tamagotchi to help till the time. I have my little book of, uh, of Sudoku. Well, I'm cause I, I gotta be there hours in advance, uh, two, three hours to get a good seat. And so, uh, I'm sitting down. And one of the um, one of the staff sees my shirt, and we're like, "Oh, well, by chance, are you? Do you have an idea what you think this is?" And I'm like, "Oh, I believe it's Transformers One." And they're like, "Oh, okay, that's not, that's not, that's good good idea. Uh, by chance, would you want to do a, a focus group after the film?" And I'm like, "Yes, yes." <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, just, that just confirms it, doesn't it? Yeah, ex- absolutely. Uh, and, I, and then I, I can also ask things like, "Oh, by chance, uh, what studio is doing the feature?" And they would say paramount or whatever or whatever else so when they said paramount i'm like oh okay you, you just confirmed it i i did kind of think it was sonic 3 uh but uh i was like ah but that's a little too far advanced i think they're still filming by the time i was watching this so you know it was good to know that it was transformers 1 which was so bizarre because uh and it's similar for rise of the beast i had a very similar situation i saw rise of the beast a year prior uh with a, a whole new opening and uh different ending like i saw the transit cut first so i was kind of surprised when tra- transit didn't show up um any uh, that, you know uh i'm uh cutting away here but uh but yeah so uh after seeing transformers one uh interesting enough though i leave the theater i you know do the focus group i say my things which mo- i didn't really have any bad notes that was one of the best things is that no one had a bad note the only note that was somewhat negative is that some of the general audience was getting a little lost in the sauce when it comes to the lore. Uh, they were they were getting they got a little bit too confused like about like the primes and the quintessence. They didn't like well, that's one of the things that the quintessence were kind of like they did show up and they didn't really know who they were and they didn't get it. Which I doubt was in your in your cut. Did they have as much of the exposition at the start? Uh, I'll say the uh, the the so when it comes to changes in my cut. Uh, for one, the after credit scene is was not included. The the Megatron after credit scene, uh, it our, my after credit scene was just the uh, B one twenty seven joke around with uh, Steve. Uh, but uh, another uh, one thing that was interesting is that uh, I swear in my cut, they do explain the Quintessons in the beginning. Like they say the same thing with Primus and the Primes, but then they say something about like, but then the Quintessons attacked. And, uh, you know, and uh, the primes were lost and the matrix is lost too. Uh, and I, which I was like, oh, interesting, interesting. Uh, cause in a way it, I feel like as a, like a data clerk or like a data entry, wouldn't you mention the quintessence attacked or I don't know. Uh, cause it, they, that part was cut and there was a whole new version of it in this official cut. Uh, but other than that, besides a couple of lines that might have been changed uh, here and there, most of my film was pretty complete. Like, even because when I see films, they're not finished. There's a uh... yeah. I remember, uh, like I think we talked about after it came out, like some differences with Rise of the Beast. But you you had mentioned I think when you first saw, it, like it was like unrendered. Like you had a different actress for RC. That's right. It was like all fin- yeah. Uh, the voice for RC was the voice actor who did RC in Transformers Prime. She was RC as well as Tom Kenny was Will Jack in my cut. Uh, and I think uh uh. I believe Ron Perlman uh, was still Optimus Primal. Uh, Rhinox talked in my version. Rhinox said uh, a line. So I heard David Silva loves Rhinox. Uh, and uh, a bunch of other things. I mean, Lily, we can go. They'll give me a whole podcast about the differences that I saw. Because a lot of the things I saw have never been talked about. Like Scourge's whole character is completely different in my cut than what we see in this one. He's, he actually has character in the cut that I saw. Um, but uh, yeah, for Transformers 1, it was pretty cut and clean i in fact like a guy like when i i really wanted to talk about the uh optimus megatron parallel when they became who they are Wait, that's real oh, go quick on. yeah sorry you have me i'm just curious in your cut did they actually did they do anything with 
was there a reason for Scourge losing his mask? Like, was there a thing about he didn't like his face or something? Because that was something that was so funny to me how they make a big deal about his mask coming and off. There's and nothing. It's just nothing. Uh, yeah. I'll say there. They. Uh, actually, if anything, it was even less. It didn't seem like it was less. No one like it wasn't. There wasn't a scene to kind of like show that. Like, if anything, it was kind of less of a big old deal in my cut. I will say he did have a mustache in my cut. He did have a more of a. And there, I know uh, Frank showed it to me. He found some of the uh, pre-rendered visual scenes that uh, that they were going to use that I saw in my theater. Uh, of he has like that long neck from the toy, and he does come, and it, it was showing the mustache bits, so it's out there. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, it was, it really wasn't a big deal in my cut either. Uh, it was just kind of like, oh okay, all right. Like he didn't even have a scarred face; it was just he had a mustache. That was that was the thing he was trying to hide, I guess. <laughs> I, actually, I like that more. You know, it's just, I didn't get to shave today. It's uh, embarrassing. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't know it could be here so quick. I I only got to see Transformers One about a month early, and the only difference between my early cut and the official cut, and I think this is just a regional thing, is B127 said sword hands in my version, not knife hands. But then when I saw it officially in theaters, he said knife hands. Yeah, I've heard some people say their cuts have said sword hands. That's too. so strange. I wonder why particularly sword between knives. What's is it is knives suddenly like is that might be too violent of a word and some countries don't like that? It could also be like I mean, I think what is did the UK get knife hands or or sword hands cuz I could see the UK censoring knife hands. I don't remember. Censorship can be is very different in different er- in different countries cuz I know when Beast Wars came out in Canada, Back then, the word wars was not allowed, so it was called beasties. Beasties. Well, there's other things, too, where it's not even censored. Sometimes other countries just get slightly... Like, the TLK debacle, where, like, Europe got an entirely different voice actor for Nitro Zeus, which I like better. Um, But, like, Stephen Barr is Nitro is to peak. I don't care. But, like, it's just things like that. Something I will say right off the bat... I want to know what your... uh, Because you said this wasn't part of your cut. When you saw the trailer and you first saw, I guess, the like the emblem crashing to the ground and like the that like yeah, shot I, of Megatron, were you like, Oh, that's new? Oh yeah, absolutely. I was like I, I, I was trying so hard to remember if I saw that or not. It really was kinda like No, yeah, because like any of Megatron that I saw was just that third act and and none of that there was no atmosphere like that. So I was like, that has to be because even the Decepticon symbol, like, that was all for me was uh, the uh, Sentinel Prime etching it into his chest. So I was, when I saw that, I'm like, that has to be a new scene because there's no way. I mean, that's for sure. Unlike Rise of the Beast, where there's some things changed that I feel like they should have kept. That was a scene where I'm like, all right, this is a perfect, perfect way to tease your upcoming story if they get one. So I will say I want to go back to a couple like several podcast episodes ago. I don't know if it I don't know if it was cut or not. This is something I know we talked about, but I know if it was cut when the trailer came out, and it I think it was trailer two. I mentioned the shot of the emblem going. I'm like mentioned speaking. I'm like, what if they do something about Megatron being branded? I was wrong about that shot being Meg- Megatron or like him being branded and then using that symbol. I was wrong about that scene being him being branded but i was so vindicated in the theater when i saw sentinel pull out his little blowtorch thingy and i'm like oh, they're actually doing exactly what i was kind of hoping they would do where he gets it branded on him and then that becomes a symbol which i know he was already liking megatronus anyway and it was like megatronus a symbol but i still felt so relieved knowing it get, got branded on like that you know when it comes to like the, that symbol of course is the face of megatronus and in his continuity who doesn't you know, betray the primes. Cooler and I have decided that, you know, in, in our continuity, Transformers 1 is the most plausible next life for the Fallen after Gigawatt 4. Watch, watch Transformers 2 reveal that Megatronus actually was, like, behind the scenes and also pulled some strings <laughs> and is a bigger villain. Uh, he faked his death like, or something. And which we can, we can absolutely feed that into Gigawatt and be like, ah, like, he was trying to do good, but he's always up to his old tricks. You can't, you know, you can't change him too good. Yeah, no, Cooler and I did think that maybe the Fallen had a couple rough trials again but yeah no i i i will say though tf1 no matter what they do with megatronus i that i 
I love that design and I love the evolution of the the logo how it's you know the first edition sticker then it was the blow torched version then it was the Decepticon logo and the Decepticon logo becomes its G1 colors in like the last few seconds that I I mean I, I already mentioned I think we all mentioned that we uh enjoyed it which by the way I can call him out too because he doesn't watch this so he won't ever hear this uh I found out Steven doesn't watch the podcast because of this because <laughs> <laughs> the reason I found out is because those who those you know before the podcast was recorded, I kept it a secret that I watched Transformers One. I just kept telling when everyone, anytime someone would ask me, "Hey, have you seen it?" or "When you're going to see it?" I just said, "I don't know," or eh, "I don't think I'll see it." Like I, I think it was like a week into me seeing it that I finally was like, "Hey, I saw it." So, um, at, but when we record the podcast, I had seen it, and I made it clear. I said in the podcast that I, we'd seen it, I enjoyed it, it was so on, but. I got a message from Steve at like a week ago going because he wanted to send me something TF1 related. And he goes, have you gotten to see it yet? And I just was like, well, I can tell someone hasn't watched the podcast. I think I even <laughs> said like, I get, I, I think I specifically said, huh, I, someone didn't watch the end of the last podcast. And then he like, I was, I was dying laughing over that. <laughs> but yes, we've seen TF1, mentioned it before, enjoyed it a lot. I feel like, I feel like for me, I guess, it's been an interesting thing. And part of the reason why why you're on here, I like to bring up the changes versus what we thought about the movie because I feel like it's the, um, like, we're all just saying the same thing. Like, on Twitter, on everyone, T1 was great. It exceeded expectations. Fantastic film. It did almost everything right. Like, I feel like I'm just repeating what every other person has said, so I don't feel like I'm putting any new input on this. No, I, I remember I asked you, I was like, what did you think of TF1? And you went, it was great. I mean, everyone's already said everything that could be said about it. I would, I stopped letting Sam talk about TF1 because the problem is he would talk to other people and look up leaks and like find things about the plot that I was avoiding. And so I was like, I can't speculate with you because you already know the answer to this. When I was sitting and watching the movie, I forgot everything I had been told. I was just so into it but going back on the uh uh record here i've heard a few people compare this movie to something and i i like to make this comparison this movie is like puss in boots the last wish and the marketing makes it look like this fun family comedy and then you get scenes like i'm done saving you and and like no i want to kill him and it's like like damn of like, so ugh. i i have a hot take hmm now, I know everyone's dogging on the marketing. For starters, I always felt the marketing did sprinkle in it. There was much more. And I I hate when people go, they should have marketed. They, like, I've seen so many people post, like, a clip, like, I'm done saving you. Or, no, I want to kill him. And they're like, why didn't they market this? Because if you had seen that in the trailer, the impact would not be there. Like, I think part of the impact is going in expecting your a million badass Atron jokes, and then you get, no, I want to kill him. I want to drag him through the mind. Like, you get that, and you're just sitting there like, what? You're, like, stunned almost. Especially because I feel like the first act of that film is very much what that first trailer is. It definitely has, it's, you know, and I think that's fine. It, it needs to be, like, have its lighthearted moments. But it, I think that start of lightheartedness, more comedic, that sense of adventure but not high stakes. I mean, there's stakes, but it's not till you get on the surface and they start experiencing everything that the stakes ramp up. That's what makes that hit so much. Agreed. I know. I is, agreed. I, I hear a lot of complaints that they, they say the marketing hurt the film. And I don't know. I, I, I feel like the marketing had, as you said, made my experience better because I wasn't expecting just the realness of certain scenes. And I, I, I sort of feel like, you know, with the box office numbers not doing too well, obviously is also because, like, the film was released at separate times in different countries. I will say also probably doing a million per early screenings did not help. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that was my thought, too. They did so many of those. I mean, so many people could just look up the plot online weeks before the movie even came out. I'm sure – I am sure it leaked, like, on pirating websites – but way before. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. It did. It sure did. It did. It did. Yeah. <laughs> there were cams going around TikTok before it was officially out anywhere. Yep. I remember we, I was warning everyone because uh, I found one on TikTok. So I had to tell everyone, like, yo, hey, watch out. It's not even out yet. And I'm seeing uh, cam rips. 
Yeah, and also the last two trailers for it showed a bit more of the seriousness. One thing I will say I wish they didn't show, and I I love the end credit scene. Why is 90% of that end credit scene in the fucking trailer too? Yeah, it's all there. Yeah, I know, yeah. I think they wanted to push that Decepticon thing in there. Like, they wanted to be like, oh, Decepticons are in it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I, I noticed when when I watched the film, though, I will say, is that I, I kind of... I, I just forgot the marketing and what I've already seen because I got so lost in it. Like, I think halfway through I went, oh, yeah, D16 does become the bad guy, doesn't he? It's just I just, you, I just kind of forget that all, all that happens. And I find the, the tone switch happens in the, the Tomb of the Primes. Oh, yeah. Where the realness and the gravity of the situation comes in. And that third act just – it's so good. I mean – it's I really like that storytelling perspective because we learn the tone changes, the audience loses its safety when the characters do. Because in the beginning, yeah, sure they have their adventure, but there's still there's a safety blanket. They don't I don't think there's ever a point where they think they're gonna die. Just maybe, oh, we'll get thrown to the bottom, we'll get deranked, but there's never a oh, we're gonna be hunted out. When their lives are flipped and their safety net is gone, is when the audience loses that comfortability of oh this is a happy little adventure of oh anything can happen from this point forward yeah i when uh the like the the first half of the film like, when they're minors pretty much like what they're all minors and as you guys were talking about earlier uh the production the uh sorry the advertisement for the film uh it does kind of feel that way of like haha jokes haha silly it's when they get their t cogs that's when i kind of lock in i'm like all right Things are getting real because, like, that's when. But at that point, uh, is this that's when you kind of get a D 16s uh, his true path to becoming Megatron because that's when he learns everything he loves in particular is a lie, and so oh god the the I'll, which I'll say um in the the change on D sixteen the Megatron there's some parts where it does seem a bit rushed and that's how it was in my cut too and I even I mentioned that I put it in my notes uh but uh, it was. I don't think there was something that you could, uh, I, I don't know. There's, it's either you make it longer and you make the film longer, uh, but, cause I actually, I love the runtime. It's not two hours. Uh, it's paced, uh, just enough to where I'm never bored. And, but like, I, I think I, I don't mind if it, it means sacrificing some of D16's development to becoming Megatron. I rather have that than be slogging with anything un, not needed. Especially on rewatches, but I already coming out of the film first, thought maybe it was a little rush, but I sat and I thought about it. And then when I saw rewatches, it kind of solidified that. And I've even seen people post threads about it on Twitter. I'm like, oh yeah, I agree with that. I actually don't think D16's arc is as rush as people think. I think a lot of people, first of all, ignore a lot of the hints early on. There's a lot of hints. He's, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. He's, he, he, they come off as jokes, but the number of times he says like, oh, I'm going to... Like I'm gonna beat you, or I'm gonna kill you, or I'm gonna hurt you for this. Like it's it's there. There's so many little moments that like where I feel like when you first watch it, you're kind of you see their relationship, and you're just kind of going with it. So you're like, oh, they're real. There's no cracks in it. They're rock solid. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, how do they go from rock solid to being falling apart? But then when you rewatch it, especially knowing where it ends up, you start seeing, well, yeah, he is Orion is kind of pushing him around, and he's kind of not, and he is being a little antagonistic, and you start seeing. Even from the get-go, there's not that iron friendship that you maybe think your first watch. Like, there is a lot of cracks there. There is a lot of divide. They're not the most compatible of friends to begin with. And then the other thing, and I saw a lot of people, like, especially the I, I want to kill him scene. Some people, like, that one seems a little rushed where I disagree because I don't think people, and this is, I've even experienced this in my own life. When your whole life changes, something you thought, I mean, you especially when that's your whole livelihood. I mean, Megatron's whole livelihood was looking up to Sentinel Prime and being this, like, this, being the gold star worker for him. Finding out that his hero is the reason, like, he's a slave, the reason why, like, there, you, that wouldn't just be a slow arc. That would be a sudden, like, your whole life is done. There's no going back from that point. So I don't actually think that is too much of a jump. I would, I understand why a character would go completely irrational learning every single bit of stability and the only good they looked up to is just all a lie their entire world is done you see him his entire personality crumbles down he is lost 
And when you give him a T-Cog and he discovers that he turns into a tank and like he transforms. And what does he do? He hysterically laughs because he, he realizes that he's like he has now the power to uh, to go against something that literally he just learned uh, has, as you said, enslaved him his entire life. And kind of makes his life meaningless. Like it was, like he could have lived something better, but has now been forced to be a slave. And now that he has a cannon, like he's, it's, it's already kind of like he's been twisting. Like, uh, I mean, he was, you know, again, he was kind of already in a, a weird state of mind prior with all those hints. But now, you gave him a gun, and so now he, he feels like he, he has that power to change things, but not just, you know, maybe not for the better. Like everyone's like how Orion sees it. Well, the thing about, like, Me- Megatron and DC seeing this is that you can absolutely understand his point of view and even side with him up to a point. Um, I think that's the neat thing about Orion and D16 is they're both correct in their own sort of initial thoughts, like, like oh, we need to sort of take down the corruption and make him pay, but they both have different views on it. And then Megatron, as time goes on, gets more... I think consumed by his own power, even when like the high guard are just chanting D sixteen, like D is just fueled by that, and just feeds his kind of it feeds his like power hungriness even more. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's been a guy who's been at the bottom this entire time, and he's just been slingshotted to the front, and he thinks he like he also has been like especially the high of killing Sentinel like that I. I'm the king of the world now. No one can step in front of me, which I think is really cool because he is literally becoming Sentinel. Like Sentinel threw away his morals and put himself first as a way to gain power over Cybertron. And after killing Sentinel, instead of stopping there, D immediately does that. He's burned it to the ground. I I will build it up from my power, you know, just like Sentinel burned it to the original Cybertronian government, Sentinel burnt to the ground so he could be in power. That is exactly what D is doing. Because a lot of people, I think... One thing that also mirrors was Sentinel. Sentinel, yeah, Sentinel's a, a dick, and he was not as like. There's no way in comparison he is to Megatron, but they did. He was still a worker for the Primes. Like he was still an underling. He was an underling that got power, destroyed what was previously established, and took over, which is exactly what D was attempting to do. Although D is a lot more justified because Sentinel at least wasn't a slave that we know of. D was straight up got his body automity take atom. You know what I mean. Um, so yeah, Transformers 1. Um, definitely enjoyed it. If it's still in theaters in your area, definitely go and support it. Uh, it is coming out on digital on the 22nd as well, um, which I think would have already passed uh, just you know, but before we release this. So I definitely purchased that. And just, again, let let uh, let them know that we, we want a sequel. We want more. And uh, the, the, as of today in this recording, uh, one of the uh, production designers... Uh, says that they have a, apparently one Josh Cooley has the entire story for two planned out and that it's quote unquote 10 times crazier than what we have already that's oh, I need more I need more I I, I, I want to get the blu-ray I want to get the 4k I want to get steel books just give me all of this yeah, and as of now uh, I mean as of recording of uh, you know the 19th of October uh, it comes out digital in like three days yeah, well, it's the 20th for me now. We went past the what? midnight for me. <laughs> oh, snap, you're right. Yep. You have so, two days. Yep, yes, definitely give Transformers 1 support. Um, And then all, and also on the topic of giving support, I think we're good to give our uh, creator shout-out here quick. And I definitely want to give uh, Merit Movies a shout-out because he just released, uh, what was it, Episode 1? Yep, of Legacy United. Of the Legacy United. Really, really, really good. Jaron, MK, you told me Jaron cooked, and when I saw it, he definitely did. Really, really good stuff. I've always loved Jaron's, like, lighting and, and, and animation. It's just, it's so good. Definitely check out Merit Movies. And, um... One, a fun little tease with Merit Movies. I will say, issue two of the comic dub, a new robot cast, even though Merit Movies did cameo in the first issue as, um, Davey, uh, he does actually take a full on role. He was actually cast as this role first before he was Davy. Davy was just because I'm like, hey, you're already in the series going forward. Can you do this in issue one? But from the get go, he is Cliff Jumper, so he will be showing ah. up in issue two. And also, uh, I do. I was like, uh, for yeah, as we're talking about his uh, first chapter of Legacy came out. 
which I'm in. I'm Laser Prime. I'm I'm in too, actually. That's I'm, right. Oh uh, yeah, that's Leo right. Prime. Yeah. I'm Leo Prime and uh, uh, Thundertron. That's right. And uh, I also I do love uh, Jaren's his way of uh, animating the choreography of his fight scenes are pretty dynamic. In exact, mm-hmm. I do love it. So please check it out. You can it, tell he watches anime. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> There's probably a lot of I mean, anime inspirations in that in that episode, but you know. Oh yeah, that yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I totally did not voice th- or base Thundertron's voice off an anime character. That's ridiculous. Yeah, who would have ever done that? <laughs> but, so yeah, check out uh, Merit movies. Very very good stuff. Um, I think we're good to just wrap it up here. So I think so too. Definitely need to thank Cyborg Raptor Matt for being here today. For your first time. Thank you guys so much. Uh, you guys are always fun to be with. Uh, and I can't wait to talk to you guys more, especially with things that I'm working on, like uh, the uh, fan dub of Chibi Godzilla, which you guys are both in. Uh, uh, ab- absolutely. I can't wait, especially uh, if I I, I want to as dub as much as I can. Season two has a lot more of the head that you are, MK. And speaking of, uh, Sam, I need to send you lines. The next episode has... A lot more of you in it, so I'm going to send you probably some lines here soon. Uh, So, yeah, uh, thank you, everybody, for listening in. And for those who don't know, did you know that MK got the ball rolling on this and that MK should be thanked for it? I swear I don't pay him to do this. (laughs) I'm not going to do it. Well, uh, I do pay him for some things, but not for this. This is true. This is true. Um, Again, thank you all for listening. We will see you in the very next month. Uh, Thank to the both of you. Again, this was a lot of fun. We had a lot to talk about today. Uh, Hey, hmm? real quick. Matt, you get to, I think from this point forward, we make the guests do it. (laughs) So once Sam is done, when the video, when we're getting to the end, you need to go fare thee well. Okay. Okay. So... Uh, ending this off in the traditional way, Matt, I'm going to give you the honors. Uh, all right. I just say the thing. <laughs> cut yes. in, cut out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> all right. Fare thee well. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Fare thee well. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast was a really stupid idea. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> I, I do say that every episode. <laughs> <laughs>